Hello and welcome to Projector and I'm in Bristol today and I'm in front of the watershed because I am actually going to see the new Neil Breen movie Cade the Tortured Crossing. I cannot believe I'm watching a Neil Breen movie. I cannot believe I'm watching a new Neil Breen movie. Cade, played by Neil Breen, has been using his AI-enhanced superpowers to fight for good and aid humanity and has invested in a hospital to that end. However, unbeknownst to Cade, the hospital is in an extremely poor state and a front for human trafficking, where Cade's evil twin, Kale, also played by Breen, whose powers and body are deteriorating, is experimenting on the patients to try and cure himself. Once Cade learns of the situation, he starts training the patients to fight back. And back in the studio. So Las Vegas architect turned filmmaker Neil Breen has managed to amass himself quite a following among bad movie fans, not least of which because his movies, from Fateful Findings to I Am Here, now have all the markings of a dirty auteur. And I don't just mean because of the unnecessary sex scenes that he keeps inserting into his films, which are genuinely quite uncomfortable. Breen's movies are very distinctive. They have a style all of their own. You can tell you're watching one of his movies from their flagrant disregard for things like pacing or acting, to the fact they keep circling back around to the same themes and concerns of vast government conspiracies, technology or AI, or casting himself as a messiah figure in the centre of the narrative. Breen's movies have become the face of modern bad movie fandom, and yet despite this, I've never actually, before now, watched one of Breen's movies, not from start to finish. I've seen plenty of my fellow reviewers tackle them over the years, so I think I've got a fairly good grasp of Breen, but truly, you never really understand something until you taste it for yourself. And thus I decided to travel all the way to Bristol's watershed to see Cade the Tortured Crossing on the big screen exactly how it deserves to be seen. And of course, it's the best choice for picking out as my first Breen movie because it is in fact a sequel to his 2018 movie Twisted Pair where he starred as twins Cade and Kale who were granted AI based powers but also were good and evil and that's basically all you need to know from Twisted Pair going in to Tortured Crossing because largely Breen does actually recap the earlier movie and shows large clips from it. It doesn't really have all that much relation to the earlier film aside from having those two characters in it. It largely exists as a standalone work. Once again the movie is introduced by Ty Singh of the Bristol Bad Film Club as well as ardent Neil Breen enthusiast Rob Hill of the Bad Movie Bible, a channel that I heartily insist you subscribe to if you haven't already. He does great work over there. But certainly I can't think of a better place to see my first Breen movie than a crowd of highly rowdy and, let's be honest, increasingly drunk bad movie fans, especially given the relatively close proximity of the Watershed's bar. There were several audience members that kind of popped out to top themselves up in the film's quieter moments. By the end of the film, cat calls like, I love you, brain, were very much a common occurrence over my shoulder. And I can definitely say that for better or for worse, brain has created an unforgettable movie experience. The first thing that immediately hits you about The Tortured Crossing is that it's entirely shot on a green screen from start to finish. It looks like a Sega CD game from the 90s. I suspect this is probably down to COVID in that it allowed him to minimise and space out his actors, but also meant that he couldn't travel out to locations. But let's be honest, Breen was already experimenting with this in its predecessor, Twisted Pair, where that had great soirs where Breen was comping himself into stock footage and photos, or just plain straight up just using the clips in the body of the narrative. The Torture Crossing takes this further and basically stretches that out to the entire movie, and Breen has absolutely no regard for whether the clips even remotely match with each other, which makes a, an extremely disconcerting effect. There is a early scene where Breen as Cade is talking about the fact that he's invested 
in this hospital. And not only has he weirdly decided that the locale for this should be in the middle of a staircase, but then it will cut to people applauding clearly in a massive arena, which makes for an absolutely bewildering juxtaposition. That means the torture crossing has a nosely different feel to Breen's other movies, which still had on location work in them that was still extremely weird because of things that Breen was asking him to do in public. But now, divorce from as much reality as he possibly can, Breen's work feels more alien than ever. And that's saying something because he's always had this kind of hallucinogenic, dreamlike quality. He's managed to cultivate largely on accident, it appears, the same thing that David Lynch has managed to do by purpose, this kind of almost dissociative archness to the entire proceedings, especially because of the frighteningly wooden performances from the actors in his movies, which almost seem like they've been raided for a local Amdram society. Brain doesn't seem to direct actors, as just move them around like clip art in the frame, and that's especially true in this movie, where they're all shot on green screens, and he can just move them around like character sprites in the Simpsons cartoon studio. Man, my references are really getting esoteric today. This is going to be fun to edit. As par for the course with Breen's movies, all the actors give flat, monotone line deliveries of things that seem like they were given to them just moments before the camera is rolling and given exactly one take to nail it. Said it all in the right order? Let's just move on. Oh, you stumbled over your words in the middle of it? It's fine. We'll include it in the movie anyway. And in The Torture Crossing, they might be the most bewildered they've ever been, especially because they literally have no context clues for their surroundings or what they're about to be comped into. There has been some debate, especially in recent years, whether Breen has become self-aware and is just knowingly playing towards his audience. The same kind of thing that afflicted Toy was so many years ago and has made much of his post-run work completely unwatched ironic or otherwise. And I think the jury is still going to be out with Breen after the tortured crossing is more widely seen, because especially in the first 20 minutes, I was definitely thinking that to myself, especially because you can't knowingly assemble these things and not think that people are going to laugh at you for it. The introduction to Cade in this movie is that he's walking down a street in somewhere in Eastern Europe and he walks into the path of an oncoming tram, which crashes into him. And by crashes, I mean it pauses and Breen goes, ugh, for a couple of frames before falling to the ground. And of course, because this is a stock photo, no one rushes to his aid or anything. No one comes out of the tram. It's just a completely still framed bit of video as Breen just awkwardly gets to his feet and goes, I'm fine, I'm fine. I guess this is his way of re-establishing the fact that his character has powers and super healing, but it's a really odd way of doing it. It's a very comical one, to say the least. And then we get this opening action sequence where he's chasing down these balaclava-clad human traffickers that kind of look more like ninjas. And he's got this kind of six million dollar man fighting style in that he can replicate himself multiple times. And it's so goofy and so incompletely done that I was in absolute hysterics in the opening stages of this movie and it almost resembles a kind of anti-comedy sketch in the way that it's kind of dragged out. Later on there's a sequence where he's walking through a field and then suddenly with no explanation whatsoever he gets into a fight sequence with a white tiger. This is a moment that is sure to be instantly memed the moment the movie hits digital platforms because it is a jaw-dropping moment even by brain standards where he cuts to himself looking at this photo of a white tiger or maybe just a picture of a tiger that he's just turned white and then it turns into a CGI creation that he has a fight with for no reason whatsoever. This has nothing to do with what has happened 
happening on screen. Breen is fighting this CGI tiger that looks so crude, it almost looks like the cow scene from Kung Pao Enter the Fist. And then it just turns into the kind of Muse character from Twisted Pear, played by a different actor, but still I think meant to be that same character. And if you're asking the question, what the hell does that have to do with anything? The answer is nothing, nothing whatsoever. Maybe the Muse was testing out his fighting skills like Kato in the Pink Panther, just attacking him unsuspectingly. I don't know. It just happens. And then the movie continues and it gets even more crazy. And I also have to mention the rolling hills where that scene takes place. A stock photo that Breen uses constantly, but especially in the film's final scenes, which looks like the same kind of hills that Julie Andrews was on in The Sound of Music. So I had to resist the urge to suddenly burst out the hills are alive with the sound of Breen. But those allegations of self-awareness are largely disproven by the rest of the movie, which is just as incompetently put together as it always is. And also, judging by his screen presence, Breen doesn't seem to possess a knowing quality in his body. He's six movies into his career, and he still doesn't know how to behave in front of or behind the camera. In front of it, Breen is an incredibly stilted performer that makes him a compelling screen presence in the reverse way, in that he does the exact opposite of what you really should be doing, and it becomes kind of perverse to see someone who so clearly should not be acting in front of the camera, making himself the central figure of the entire movie, like he always does. Brain always puts his ego front and centre in these movies, and given that he has an entirely digital world to reign over, you get a big dose of that in The Tortured Crossing, in that we get an early sequence where he rides around in his prized Ferrari that we've glimpsed several times in his movies, and now appears to have had a green screen propped up behind it so that he can drive it on camera. But also, his character... I kid you not, actually lives in a castle like he's Dracula. This leads to a fabulously weird sequence where Breen leads the patients back to his castle and this results in all of them going, wow, a castle, oh my goodness, a castle. He does a reaction shot for every single one of the characters and he does this because Breen is apparently loath to throw any footage out whatsoever all of it must go into the movie in some way, even if it's completely repetitious like it is here. But he leaves them inside and greets them and says that the castle is absolutely filled with tens of rooms for them to sleep in, which feels like an absolutely bizarre place for him to live, considering he only appears to be living there by himself. And rather understandably, the doctors decide they don't trust him. So their solution is that instead the patients are going to sleep on the ground floor by the staircase on the stone flooring. And that's exactly what they do, because that's not weird in the slightest. Breen doesn't seem to understand concepts like context or logic. He mostly just seems in love with the sound of his own voice and gives himself ample room to speechify from the aforementioned staircase scene to a scene set in a courtroom where he appears to take the judge's podium to give a speech to the crowd, the same crowd from the stairwell scene earlier, that makes you wonder, okay, is this character now a judge? Is he, like, handing down the legal ramifications of what he's talking about here? I don't know, and the movie never makes it clear. In fact, he so loves the sound of his own voice that there are several moments where his character walks into scenes that are clearly established as having no one around to talk to, and Breen will suddenly cut to a hard, dramatic close-up of his face, just saying some awe-inspiring, altruistic thing, which might be impressive or dramatic if A, he was saying them to anyone, and B, they made any sense in the situations that he was saying them in. Who are you talking to, Breen? You're talking to absolutely no one! What makes this worse is that I genuinely believe that Breen thought he was saying something. The movie is just about coherent enough that it kind of comes across as Breen's critique on the healthcare system and mental health in 
particular. And that's a valiant thing to talk about, but also it appears to be a critique of that system from someone that has no idea how it works or operates. Take the hospital at the center of the movie. It's not just run down. It appears to be actively dilapidated and falling down around the patients. The backdrops used throughout the entirety of those scenes are all pictures taken in an extremely run-down environment that appears to have been abandoned for maybe more than a decade. And so you have literally paint coming off the walls. You've got loads and loads of clutter and mess. There's no order to anything whatsoever. But also, this mental hospital, as clearly established in a stock shot that Breen uses several times over the course of the movie, also appears to be doing full-on medical procedures like blood tests and experiments, which are not typically the sort of things found in a psychiatric institution like the one that is meant to be depicted in the movie. Bree just conflates the two together because I guess they're hospitals, so I guess they're pretty much the same thing. No, they don't function necessarily the same way. They're two different things. The fact the hospital is so appalling, rats wouldn't even stay in it, makes the fact that Cade openly states they invested in the hospital sight unseen absolutely hilarious. Maybe you should have done a little bit more research for pouring your money into this. Really, that's all down on you. Also, Kate didn't invest in this by himself. He also collaborated with his friends in Big Business, which you'll be completely unsurprised for a Neil Breen movie, turns out to be completely corrupt and untrustworthy and fully intent on exploiting the patients to get the most money out of them. Luckily, that's something that a random, poorly composited explosion can fix. But the true scale of just how bad Breen is as a director is on full display in the interminable middle act of the movie. It is torturous for both the patients and the audience. It feels like it will never end. Breen, even this late into his career, still doesn't understand basic cinematic language or editing in that when you're cutting together scenes, you don't need an establishing shot of a location before the characters step into it. But there are several moments where Breen cuts to completely empty locations, just showing us empty backdrops before the characters walk into them, maybe minutes later. That's not how movies work. There will be moments where scenes just drag on and on and on as we wait for characters to slowly walk and exit out of the frame. It's not a play, you can cut all that stuff out and it would be far more economical than having to just sit through the drudgery of the middle portion of this movie, amplified by the fact that Breen loops over an ambient horror movie soundtrack through all these scenes in the hostel. So you have this wailing ah, 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 over about half an hour of the movie in the middle, it grows extremely tedious. There are several moments where I think the actors are just improvising based on a prompt, specifically the idea that they're on a mattress, they're going through drug withdrawal symptoms, and they're just writhing around on the bed. And there are not one, but two scenes, at least, that are virtually identical in content that are just like this. And the actors say pretty much the same things in both of these sequences. And it seems like Brain just went, I'm just putting both of these in the movie. There's also a whole stretch of the movie that are just completely superfluous and unnecessary. There's an entire subplot about a group of police detectives trying to track down the human trafficking ring related to the hospital. That goes completely nowhere. Absolutely nothing comes of that subplot. It just takes up time of which we do not need. Breen himself actually disappears for large swaths of the middle section of this movie. And when Breen does appear, it's usually as the evil twin Kale, who is the real mastermind behind all this. And the fact that he's playing a dual role in both this and Twisted Pair allows Breen to show off the full dramatic range of his ego, and he allows himself to play the perfect virtuous hero, but also the increasingly pitiful villain, who over the course of the film gets 
ever weaker and more scarred, and by the end of it is a blubbering mess crying, please kill me, please kill me. And I do wonder if Breen convinced himself that we were all going to go, oh, he's such a brilliant, marvelous actor. He has depths I've never seen before, instead of us just wondering if he spent much of lockdown watching Jeff Goldblum in The Fly. Mercifully, it appears that Breen has actually taken some advice on board because this doesn't have the sex or nudity that was in Sarah Breen's earlier work. He does still have a love interest, though, perplexingly. About two-thirds of the way through the movie, the blonde doctor, because Breen has a type, suddenly starts falling for Cade. This is despite the fact that their relationship up until this point was actually quite antagonistic and she didn't trust him, but also she was not established as being a very nice person to begin with. One of the earliest scenes in the movie is her very coldly escorting the patients out for the road trip and she's literally throwing away the crutches they're using to walk on the ground because they won't fit in the car. This is meant to be the romantic interest of the movie. And then we get this love scene between her and Cade, which is them wandering out into the woods onto this little bridge and then I guess they kneel down together? It is the most chaste, G-rated love scene you'll ever see outside of conservative Christian media. It is a really bewildering scene to witness, not least of which because both actors still appear to be deeply, deeply uncomfortable being this close together, and honestly, they just want it to stop. And one of them is the director. Thankfully for bad movie fans, the movie picks up in its final act when Cade Fye decides to train the patients to fight back. One of the few amenities the patients of the hospital are afforded is a Casio keyboard, of all things, so there are several scenes devoted to one one of the patients just playing around with a Casio keyboard for an extended period of time. And this culminates in something that I don't think anyone would have predicted in my screening, in that there is a Casio keyboard dance number. Yes, that's right. There is a Casio keyboard musical number towards the end of this movie. And if you expected a lot of poorly coordinated, awkward dancing against a green screen just composited all together, congratulations, you can collect your prize of having to watch this for several minutes straight. It is hilarious. That's the culmination of a training montage where Kay teaches his students martial arts, and if you thought their dance moves were uncoordinated, you should see their high kicks. I think I've seen better coordination in a bunch of three-year-olds than some of the actors playing the patients. Those kicks are just hilariously awkward and lurchy, and they get even funnier the more Breen recycles them over and over again, just looping them like a GIF file over and over again, especially by the time of the film's climax, which almost has to be seen to be believed, this mass battle scene that exists almost entirely in one continuous shot, where it seems like Breen is trying to see just how many timelines he can stack in his editing package, so you just have these looped animations over and over again again for a whole mass of characters, and of course Breen has no shame in just recycling elements, so Breen in the corner there is just him recycling footage from the beginning of the movie fighting bad guys, and now he's just fighting the same bad guys at the end of the movie, because I guess that's a good way of cost cutting. And then, just to make the film even more recycled, the final scene of the movie is literally the same final scene as the end End of Twisted Pear. He even does the E.T. thing where he does, I'll be right here with the lens flare finger. He actually does that for a second time in this movie. And the effect is less E.T. and more reminiscent of a Burns for All Seasons. Pure egotism. Self-indulgent tripe. Cade the Tortured Crossing is another example of why Neil Breen's films straddle that line between being fascinating train wrecks and completely unwatchable. This is not something for a casual bad movie fan. Certainly, it's not going to be your first bad movie. This is something that you'd need to build up the fortitude to watch. You need to watch this with people that will probably riff it with you to try and get through those long, boring stretches. But believe me, when you get to the hilarious moments, 
it'll feel worth it. If you're a Breen fan, you'll find so much to enjoy if that is entirely the right word. And certainly for me, it was definitely an experience I won't be forgetting any time soon. Neil Breen is definitely the Monday equivalent of Ed Wood. And let's just hope, for all our sakes, he never becomes self-aware. If you like this review and you want to support my work, you can find the links to do so along with my social media pages on the link tree below. Or you can go to my Patreon, where you can see my videos early among other perks, including access to my Discord server, or you can simply like, share, and subscribe. It all helps. Until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.